Our last objective is um, about the first set of cognitive biases, which are related to loss aversion. So those reflexive behaviors related to loss aversion. This is one of our strongest and most common judgment errors um, because we are, we're wired to seek out positive, seek out reinforcement and avoid negative, avoid those aversive conditions. Um, you know, it's all about winning. It's all about what can we get? What can we, you know, we've adapted to, you know, drive and have those urges and strive to get as much good stuff and avoid as much bad stuff as possible, right? And that's, um, as we've talked about, that's on, you know, we have auto, we're on autopilot and we're just, we're functioning as though, um, there's not, you know, in a, in a way that is non-intentional. We're just, you know, going with the flow. And whatever has the biggest, you know, the biggest bang for the buck is the thing that we're going to go for. Um, and as we talked about, it's sometimes that's adaptive, sometimes that's good, but at other times it can be very negative. Um, and those quick wins aren't always going to lead to long-term outcomes. So the, there are uh, six uh, cognitive biases related to loss aversion. And the first one is the status quo bias. Status quo bias. And so as humans, we are biased to engage in behaviors that are going to maintain the status quo and avoid change. Even if, even if change in the end would be good, if the change process is perceived as too difficult, too cumbersome, um, or there's going to be too much pain associated with the change, the status quo then starts to feel like it's fine, right? Like it's good, it's not that bad, it doesn't hurt that bad, I only cry a little bit, um, I'm not, you know, doing anything about it sounds way worse, or I feel, I perceive that it's going to be way worse. And so, you know, we have, we have a bias to not take action because of the potential pain and suffering that the change process could um, entail. Okay. The next related bias is this, the information bias. And so, you know, when, this is the, um, this is where you get into that analysis paralysis where you know that a change needs to be made. You know there's a problem, you gotta do something about it, right? And so you start gathering information and you gather more information. Are you ready to make a decision yet? Ready to change? Nope. Still gathering information, still gathering information, even if it's irrelevant. Nope, I'm still gathering. Are you ready to make a decision yet? Anybody ready to change? Are we, are we you know, we got what we need? Nope. All right, still, I still need more. And so, you know, this becomes that habitual loop of like, I've got a problem. Okay, just keep asking questions, keep talking to people about it, right? And we're not gonna do anything about it. We're just gonna keep talking about the problem and keep rehashing it and rehashing it and not changing it. We've become paralyzed by analysis or just talking about things. Um, the, uh, the next one is sunk costs. And so um, this is one that I'm sure many people have experienced where you have invested so much, you've invested so much time and energy into the thing that, you, that you're doing, the decision that you made, the action that you're taking, that the idea, the thought of just cutting your losses, cutting your ties, moving away, just like letting go of it feels impossible um, because you've put so much into it because 
we are averse to that loss. So cutting ties means losing everything, all that work uh, that I put in. Um, the idea of endowment effects is um, in relation to the things that we're doing and the decisions we're making has to do with this idea that we put a lot of value on to the things that we do. So the thing, you know, our business, we put a lot of value, we put a lot of value on that. And so again, if you, if you place a lot of value in it, um, whether that's warranted or not, it is going to be hard to want to give that up or to change or to stop investing time and energy into the thing that you're, that you're doing. And so the, the thought of losing that really, really important thing, even though like from an outsider perspective, it might not be considered that important. It's hard to let go. Um, a related, the other related one is the Ikea effect. And so that is putting more value, a high val higher value on the things that you have created. So it's something that I have done, therefore it's of higher value, and therefore I can't let it go. I have, you know, this is critical, this is a key to who I am, um, and so I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, decide to give that up or let that go or change course because of how important that is. Um, and then the last one is uh, the kind of the opposite of that, which is to devalue the businesses and products of others. So this, you know, the not invented here bias is that, you know, you're, um, you're less likely to choose to go in a different direction and um, place higher value on something, somebody else's business and something else, something that somebody else has done um, because that generally is devalued compared to you. Like, I am the gold standard, my business is the best, my product is the best, whatever you've done is not as good as mine. Even though, you know, again, like if you were to ask the questions and do the research, that is possibly not true, but you are, because we are inherently biased to believe that, you know, we're the pinnacle peak or the end all be all and every, you know, everything else and everybody else is lesser than. Um, that, can, that can cause us problems with, within our decision making. So the final exercise for this lesson and for the exercise for objective three is to think about these biases and how they have impacted your decisions. And then to take that next step and identify which of the 12 techniques could, um, that we talked about to prevent judgment errors could have been helpful in preventing those, uh, preventing any problems that you had. So in regard to my, um, my story, my decision that, uh, that I made, when I lived in Arizona, when I was working um, as a clinical director, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of okay with the status quo in, in relation to the fact that it was, um, you know, I, was, I would consider myself comfortably numb, right? So I had a good job, it was consistent, I was getting paid well, and things were, you know, there were, there were lots of problems that I saw, but they were things that I could, I could just kind of like, okay, well, I'm just going to like brush that off. I'm just going to keep working. I'm going to keep pushing through it because I don't want to, like, I like my house. I like my life. I like my friends. Change is too hard, right? And so I was at that status quo was just like, well, I'm comfortably numb, going through the motions, whatever. We're just going to, we're just going to keep going on. Um, and then, but then I got to that, you know, I kind of would oscillate between like, yeah, I'm fine. Like, I'll just, I'm just going to suck it up and deal with it. And then to the other side, which was like, no, I need to change. Um, but this is where I kind of, I fell into that analysis paralysis mode where it was like, 
you know, again, like I would just, okay, here's the problem, here's the solution. Let me just like, just throw all these solutions and try to fix all this stuff. Um, let me analyze this problem. Let me talk it to death. Let me, I'm going to talk to my supervisor about it again and again, at every super, supervision meeting. Um, but nothing ever changed, never, nothing ever really got done about it. So it was, you know, just kind of this paralyzed. Um, and I had, you know, I and my husband, my husband and I had sunk so much um, into our, you know, into our career and our life and our, you know, just everything that we did, we had, we had invested all of ourselves into it. And so, you know, so that made it, you know, the, the thought, the thought of leaving and giving it all up and putting that all away was hard to think about because, you know, we just put all of this all, so much into it, but because of the problems, it was also hard to stay. So it was kind of, you know, just like that push pull of that decision was so difficult. But in, in reflecting on the way that we made the decision. And, you know, I talked about, we just step, went, jumped from step one to step seven of that decision-making process, you know, didn't ask any questions, didn't really do a thorough analysis, didn't, you know, get anybody else's perspective. Um, when thinking about these cognitive biases, what I came to realize is that in addition to me, in addition to like me as an individual having biases and, the, and these biases affecting the way that I think and the way that I make decisions, what I also realized is that it is possible to absorb the biases of others and um, without question. And, you know, I haven't really 100% wrap my mind around like exactly how that happens but we do you know we do as humans have a tendency to engage in observational learning so when you you see somebody doing something and it's somebody in a position of authority or somebody you value um it is common to imitate that behavior um without really thinking about you know why you're imitating it or the value of that. Um, and so, you know, when I was reflecting upon the decision that we made, I really realized that um, my husband and I absorbed the biases of my parents. They had sunk so much into the farm that really the only choice for them was to sell it or to um, you know ramp ramp things up to the next level from kind of the mom and pop farm that it was to a more you know a, a bigger scope of sales and bigger productions um, and so you know they had sunk so much into that and so when we were talking to them about the decision kind of like fed off of that oh my gosh this my parents have put all of this money into that. And thereby, like by association, I feel like we've put all of our money, you know, put that money into there. And so it became our responsibility to, um, you know, come to the rescue and save the day. You know, they perceived the value of the business as very high. And that's the way that they would talk about it to us and to others. And so we valued the business as very high. So again, without asking any other questions, without thinking deeply about, you know, the data behind that feeling, those thoughts and feelings, it was as though we didn't even, didn't even consider that what they were thinking or feeling was inaccurate. But looking back on it, knowing what I know now, I know that the value that they placed on the business and the value they placed on the product was way higher than the actual facts. And had we gathered the relevant information, relevant data from important sources, we would have seen that. But again, we didn't. We were kind of absorbing those biases of others and just taking them at face value and basing our decisions on 
on that, that kind of the emotionality of others. Um, so they sunk these costs. And so we sunk these costs or, you know, so we didn't want to let it go. They perceived their value or perceived the value of their business as super high. So we perceived the value of their business as super high. They perceived and, and um, you know, explained their product as being of high value. That's what we, that was our perception. So we just absorbed those thought processes, absorbed those biases and perceptions. And then the last one is that low perceived value of others. So our business and our product is awesome and you should invest your time and energy in, in it. Those people's business and pro product is crap. And so by comparison, you know, the, the, these are bad, these are great, come here and you know, everything will be great. Had I engaged in the techniques of um, exploring alternative explanations and, and choices, um, gathering more, you know, gathering information from more relevant sources, um, considering the perspectives of others, um, considering even past experiences, past experiences working with my parents in business, um, we should have and he, we could have made different decisions. But, you know, all of those contextual factors, I wasn't, you know, things weren't going well with my job and I was really stressed out and I knew that there, you know, a lot of things needed to change, but nothing, nothing was changing and I didn't feel effective at making those changes. We had this opportunity, grass was greener on the other side, you know, those cognitive biases, grass was really, really green on the other side. And so it was easy to make that leap um, from, you know, step one to step seven without, without um, addressing any of those other uh, steps. But again, had we have done that, we would have made different decisions. Had we have taken those steps, we could have prevented significant pain and suffering. Does that mean that I am upset about where I am today? No, but it does give me perspective. And it does give me like having gone through those experiences and now knowing what I know, you know, knowing what I know now and being able to think back upon those, um, the thoughts, words, and actions, the steps that we took and the steps that we skipped and the questions that we could have asked that we didn't and the biases that we had that we were unaware of, um, you know, things could have been different. Pain could have been prevented. I can't go back in time and change anything about what happened. So psychological flexibility skills come into effect now and I can just accept that pain for what it is and what it was and learn from it um, and accept it and remain present and centered in the in this moment and continue moving forward but with the lessons that i've learned now having this information to apply and think about okay here's where here's where we went wrong and now i know now i have a plan and again, it doesn't mean it's perfect. Just because I know something doesn't mean that I'm going to do it consistently and perfectly all of the time. But having a greater awareness of the steps that needs to be taken, the things that need to be done in order to make more effective decisions and prevent disastrous decisions, prevent poor judgment. Um, now, I am more confident that when I choose to act, it will, because, it will be because I have intentionally gone through the process of, of those steps to avoiding those problems and debiasing, um, debiasing from those kind of that automatic responding. Um, and it makes me more confident that I will be, you know, the likelihood of success will be higher. Is it guaranteed? Absolutely not. Nothing is guaranteed. But because I now have a process and now I have a different way of looking at things, I can take what I, I can take the experiences that I've had and use those to inform the decisions that I have in front of me today and 
that will hopefully lead to more positive outcomes in the future. Okay, so on um, the final, um, final little bit here, just to wrap up and talk about the homework. Um, as you will notice from the first course to the second course, I've, I've pared things down a little bit um, based on feedback throughout the course in relation to the um, amount of reading and the amount of work. Um, it was, you know, kind of out of alignment with the um, with the number of credits and the um, you know the number of hours that should be um, put into this put into this course. And so things have been pared back a little bit, but I do I think that you know I've kept the things that were really important and let go of the things that were, you know, that were good, but not necessarily necessary. Um, so I'm, I'm open to receiving additional feedback if um, regarding kind of what's working and what's not working. Um, but for the next lesson, which will be next Saturday, um, the chapters from Never Go With Your Gut are um, chapters three through five, and this will cover cognitive biases related to misattribution, misperception, and overconfidence. Um, there are exercises related to each of the objectives within the course dashboard, um, and then there is a, a personal reflection question to provide feedback on the lesson, um, which will be consistent across the lessons. And so with that, um, in closing, I really appreciate your participation in the second course. I'm really excited to continue talking about how we can de-bias um, our decision making in order to make a, a more effective decisions. I'm excited to really dive into system, behavioral systems analysis to really start to kind of teach you and encourage you to think more in systems. So when you're making decisions, so rather than just focusing on this mind, you know, the small decision and, and how it affects the small part of the system, thinking more about, you know, this, how this situation, how this issue is related to the bigger system and what changes that might mean that need to be, that need to ripple through the whole entire system. And then finally, bringing it all together and coming back to this idea that if we want to work effectively together, make changes together, sustain and maintain those changes over time, it is critical for us to be able to effectively work together to collaborate. Um, and so the final book on Inc radically inclusive meetings, bringing everybody, important stakeholders to the table to talk about the problems, talk about potential solutions, and, and work together to overcome biases and create solutions which have the system in mind, not just an individual cog, um, is going to be critical. Um, and it's, I'm really excited to you know, help br to bring this all together um, so we can learn how to make more effective decisions and take more effective action to create peace in our world and the world around us. So with that, I bid you a good day and I will see you next weekend. Have a good one.